Blog Talk Radio. This is activist minister Omar Wilkes. Welcome to Unison Global Talk. Now is the time to buckle your seatbelts and get ready for a mind flight. Welcome back to Unison Global Talk on this Friday at 12 noon through 1 p.m. I thank God for allowing me to be here today to share what I believe to be valuable information each week. I believe to be valuable information. I'm not asking people to agree with me on every topic because Unison Global Talk is a forum that calls on people to give critical thought to issues and create a serious, substantive, in-depth dialogue and create uh, a dialogue, an extensive dialogue. I have gotten positive feedback from people about this show for doing our best to be truthful no matter who likes it or not. This show is not meant to cater to the left or the right, of the political spectrum, but rather to be a voice for the voiceless, to speak out for the oppressed, and speak truth to power, and not be concerned about what anybody think, you know, about, uh, you know, concerned about whether somebody, you know, thinks we're saying the wrong thing or, or we shouldn't say such and such. But we believe that it's important for this show to be honest to have the courage to speak truth to power. Today we have some very important matters to discuss. I don't think you want to miss it. You might want to consider reaching out to someone you know and tell them that Unison Global Talk is on the air, alive. We have a guest speaker, Khadija Shakur, from the New Black Panther Party, uh, that will speak in a few moments. Um, Our lines will be open and you can call into Unison Global Talk at 347-994-1262. Let me repeat that. The number is 347-994-1262. At this moment, um, I would like to you to take advantage of the technology that you have in front of you. Um, email blast. This broadcast, put it on your Facebook, Twitter, blog, and all that good stuff so that others can hear the same information as you in this broadcast. One matter, um, you know, deeply, deeply, deeply has disturbed me, has been on my mind all week. It's been really bothering me, listening audience. Uh, Something that just pains me to my heart that I wanted to share with you, I want to speak, um, touch bases uh, with something uh, that will disturb you also. And uh, I feel like I could vent the deep agony that I feel I'm feeling, you know, on this show. I'm pretty sure that um, some of you heard of what happened in Detroit, Michigan, to seven-year-old Ayanna Jones. For those who are not aware of what happened, I will give you a brief idea. The police this past Sunday, early morning, uh, carry out a raid that was terrorist in nature early Sunday morning while this black family were sleeping in their home. While an innocent black family was sleeping, took place. Detroit police accompanied by a camera crew for a reality television show approached this house. Seeing that there were children toys in the yard and people outside indicating that there were little children in the house, 
there was people indicating that there were children in the house before these police officers approached the house. The police went forward anyhow, looking for a suspect they had a warrant for. The police did not follow police procedure. They approached the wrong apartment. Instead of knocking the door down, they threw a flash grenade through the window from the porch, which landed on a seven-year-old little girl and lit her on fire. And the officer proceeded to shoot through the window in which a bullet ripped through the neck of that little seven-year-old girl. After the shooting of the little girl, they dragged her. They dragged this little girl out of the house like a garbage bag. They didn't even have enough respect. After lighting her on fire, after shooting her in the neck, they did not even have enough respect. They did not even have enough respect to pick this little girl up and at least put their hand over her womb. They didn't even have enough respect to do that. But the cop grabbed this little girl by the arm who was bleeding from her neck from this bullet wound and burned up, her body burned up. They dragged her out the house like a garbage bag. And the way I am aware of this is because the lawyer, the reality TV crew, who had the tape, showed the tape to the lawyer. The lawyer already saw it, and he was telling the people to come, the cops to come forward with the truth. And he said that on the tape it shows how the cops dragged the little baby out by the arm. Instead of picking her up, they dragged her out like a garbage bag while she was bleeding from her neck. In the house, they tried to even frame the grandmother. They made up a false story in the beginning saying that the, the shot went off in the house due to the grandmother, due to the grandmother bumping into the police, and the shot went off. But when they realized that that story wouldn't hold up, because they must have forgotten in the heat of the moment that their cameras were still rolling, and then they try to make up and go back and say, clean up their story and say that outside of the house, they pulled the trigger by accident and it went off simultaneously by accident. But you know what? Before, with that first story that they made up, with the first story they made up initially saying that the grandmother bumped into to, to them, they lied about it. They went on to proceed to arrest the grandmother. They went to proceed on to proceed to arrest the grandmother to make it look as if she was the fault why the shot went off. So they arrested the grandmother. That's what they did. They arrested her, handcuffed her, arrested her. They tried to frame her. And, make, and you know what? You know what makes matters worse? What makes matters worse, they made the little girl, they made the father of the little girl lay down, face down, in his daughter's blood. This is sadistic. This is sadistic. This is sadistic. While the cops huddled, trying to concoct a false story, and this is all on the camera, according to the lawyer, it shows this camera foot, uh, this video footage shows the cops huddling together trying to concoct a story. They did not realize that reality TV cameras were still rolling. The video. I am so deeply disturbed by this brutal killing of the seven seven year old Ayana. I am deeply disturbed by the killing of this young sister and this sadistic cover up. Even though I'm in New York, there's no way 
There is no way I can sit idly by as a man and as a father and do nothing. As men, this is the time to step up and show our manhood because now the cops are killing our precious jewels, which, is, which are our babies, and then having the audacity to cover it up. Even though many cannot make it to Detroit to get involved in the protest, one of the things you can do now is call the Detroit Police Commissioner's Office to express your outrage. Call them. Don't sit back and feel like you can't do anything. Call them. Pick up the phone and call them. You may not be able to make it there, but I encourage you to pick up the phone at least and call them because you can make a difference even through a phone call. The telephone number to the Detroit uh, Police Commissioner's Office is 313-596-1800. Three one three five nine six one eight three zero. Let me let me repeat it one more time. Three one three five nine six one eight three zero. Please call the police commissioner's office today. Um, I am also uh, I got a call uh, from Sister Jewel Allison. She called me. Um, and uh, she told me that she couldn't sleep herself because she has a daughter. She couldn't sleep herself. And everything she, every time she thought about it, she said something was saying to her, what can you do about it? What can you do about it? And so she called me, and uh, she reached out to me, and she said that she wanted to coordinate this rally. So... I think it's pivotal for us to get involved in somehow, even if you can't make the rally, the least you can do is make a phone call. Let me give you that number one more time just in case somebody missed it. The number is 313-596-1830. 313-596-1830. You know, one of the things that happened to me, too, and I must confess, you know, uh, not really confess, but I must mention that uh, I remember uh, the other day when I heard about the story of what happened to the little girl, and um, and the little girl looks so much like my daughter. You know, my daughter is seven years old, and uh, I looked over, you know, at, my daughter was sleeping and everything, and I looked over uh, at her, and I said to myself, and I felt so troubled and bothered, and I, I said, I thought about what the cops did to that little girl, and I said to myself, this could happen to my child. This could happen to my child, and I can't sit back and do nothing. Because you know what? Ayana is my child. She's your child. We can no longer just accept full responsibility for our own children, but every child in our community is our child. And no cop has a right to kill our babies and then try to cover it up. That's sick. It's sadistic. And uh, uh, before um, we bring our guest speaker on, uh, Sister Khadija Shakur, um, who will be coming up in a moment, Uh, First, um, I would like to uh, read an article in regards to the situation um, that I was just telling you about. Um, uh, It's dealing with Sister uh, Little Baby Ayanna Jones, a seven-year-old little girl. And uh, this was uh, one of the articles uh, that first came out right after she was killed. And uh, it goes on to say, I'm going to read the article for you. Says police, uh, Detroit police uh, carried out a raid on the family home uh, that left seven-year-old dead on the weekend. Uh, they were accompanied by a camera crew, and it goes on to say that 
the attorney uh, says the video of the siege contradicts the police account of what happened. And it goes on to say in this article, uh, Jeffrey uh, Feiger, an attorney for the family, uh, young Ayanna Jones, said uh, he has seen three or four minutes of the video of the raid, although he declined to say whether it, it was shot by the crew for the A and E series. The first 48, which has been uh, shadowing Detroit's homicide detectives for months, police have said officers threw a flash grenade uh, through the first uh, window of the family's home and that the officers gun discharged, killing the girl during a struggle or after, uh, after a struggle or colliding with the girl's grandmother inside the home. This is what the police officers said. You know, this is, what, this is their first story that they made up. And then they changed it around uh, a couple of days later uh, when they realized that their story wasn't going to hold up. The article goes on to say, but Fieger said the video shows an officer lob, uh, lobbing the grenade and then shooting it into the home from the porch. There is uh, no question about what happened because it is on videotape, Fieger said. It's, no, it's not an accident. It's not a mistake. There was no altercation. Ayanna Jones was shot from outside on the porch. The videotape shows clearly uh, the officer throwing uh, the, 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 through the window a stun grenade type explosion. And then within um, milliseconds of throwing that, firing a shot from outside the home, he said. A&E spokesman uh, Dan Silberman said, neither uh, V nor anyone else from the network would comment about the case. And he denied a request by the Associated Press for the footage. Detroit police uh, were trying to obtain the film crew crew's footage. Assistant Chief Ralph Godby said Monday, Fieger said the investigation into what happened during the raid needed to go no further than the videotape. And that's, the, uh, that's, that's what's in the article. And I hope this videotape uh, does not disappear. I hope it doesn't disappear. The world is watching. The world is watching. The world is watching. This shows the world, the nation, and in our communities how police cover up their tracks or try to cover up their tracks when they do something wrong. There is no justification in what they did. And you know what? I'm going to bring Sister Khadija on the uh, on the, uh on the line in a moment. Um, and one thing I want to say is that there's no way if they can do this to a little girl, if they can do this to a little girl and cover up and try to frame her family, if they can do that, can you imagine all the other cases in our community revolving around Sean Bell, Patrick Dorsman, Amadou Diallo, and many other people? If they can try to cover up their tracks after killing a baby, a seven-year-old little girl, we should be outraged about this. We should be up in arms. We should be shutting down our communities. They showed uh, um, on YouTube, they had a, um, a film, they showed a, um, a clip of the mother standing in front of the home grieving around what happened, they showed the grandmother present. And you know what I was disappointed about? Is that our brothers need to step up. Our brothers need to step up and take charge. You're killing our, they're killing our babies now. This is the time to take a stand and not sit idly by. I don't care where you live. You know, I don't care if you live on the West Coast or the East Coast or wherever you live. 
we have a moral obligation to get involved, especially when they're killing our children. Where is the insult level that we should have, you know? But um, and I'm, I'm going to bring on, first um, I want to say that we have a guest speaker today. Uh, I'm grateful, I am so grateful for uh, Sister Khadija Shakur. She is a, a leader and a representative of the new Black Panther Party. Um, she is here today. She has been a courageous, a courageous freedom fighter for social justice and continues to uphold uh, the great legacy of Khalid Muhammad, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, and many others. Khadija Shakur has been on the front line of local, national, and international uh, affairs that affects black people. I welcome on Unison Global Talk, Sister Khadija Shakur. Thank you, Sister, for coming today. Uh, thank you so much, Brother, for having me on. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be on and to share knowledge with our people. Um, I am in route um, uptown, so I'm not going to be able to stay too long. But I just yes, wanted yes. to um, to just come on and just um, share whatever knowledge and wisdom that I can with my people. Thank you, Sister Khadija. I have a question, Sister. Uh, did you grow up in New York? What was what was your upbringing like? Well, um, my father was from Grenada. My mother was born here um, in the United States of America. She has roots down south, and I grew up in Harlem. Um, I lived in Strivers Row, in Klein, as they call it, and then I moved out to um, to Brooklyn. I went to Catholic school. I went to St. Charles, two on 42nd Street, not too far from where I grew up. And I was raised a Catholic. And um, I remember um, in the 60s, um, I remember the original Black Panther Party in the streets of Harlem. And there was a sister that lived up the block from me. She was like four years older than me. She was 18, and I was 14 at the time. And she used to take me to the meetings. Um, she used to take me to the demonstrations. And me being an immature 14-year-old, knew nothing about black liberation, knew nothing about mm -hmm. pan-Africanism, but I just thought that it was real cool to hang out with a black panther and go to the meetings <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and go to the police demonstrations. But little did I know, 30 to 40 years later, that I would actually be um, standing on the shoulders of our foremothers and forefathers. So wow. I, I always give honor and privilege to them. Wow. Amen. Amen. Um, who is uh, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, and how has he impacted your life? Oh, boy. Do you have all day? Do you have a week? <laughs> well, uh, let, me, let me just try to be as brief as I can. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, um, as he was often referred to as the sword of Allah, um, was the boldest, blackest, most uncompromising, unapologetic. And when I talk about him, I always start off with that because so many of our people due to fear, the fear that has been inbred in us and the, the shame of being black that has been um, taught to us, um, we're always apologetic for being black. We're always apologetic for being angry at the white supremacy and racism that has been levied and heaped upon our people for 500 to 6,000 years. But Dr. Khalil Abdul Muhammad meant so much to me because he taught me how to not be, um, he taught me not to feel sorry for being angry. He taught me not to be apologetic, not wow. to be compromising, not to negotiate with the enemy. But people who have taken our, 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 our history from us, our names, our religion, our, everything from us, he's taught mm -hmm. us not to be that way because we've often been taught, you know, to turn the other cheek and we should forget about that. But there's other groups of people like the Jews, they don't forget. And it's okay not to forget. It's okay to be angry. Nobody can tell us how to hurt. Nobody can tell us how to express that hurt. So that's one among many things that Dr. Khalid has taught me, to not be you know, to be unapologetic. I mean, I'm not talking about to be arrogant, egotistical arrogance. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about you can be humble with humility, but to be unapologetic for who you are, to not compromise when our babies are dying in the street with the police, 
I mean, we know that all police are not bad, but we're calling on the police department. We're calling on police mm-hmm. all nationwide to come forth and stand up and to speak out against what happened to this sister. And I'm not talking about this young sister. I'm not talking about standing behind a microphone as part of an organization. And I'm talking about doing some foot soldier work. I'm talking about getting out here and doing what you got to do by any means necessary to make sure that this doesn't happen. So I, I just want to put mm-hmm. that bit in. I'm calling on all the police officers all the black and Latino police officers in particular, to come out and to stand up and to speak out against what happened to that young sister and to also speak out about the situation in Philadelphia where it's caught on tape that a police officer was beating up, punching a mm. brother in the face mm. while he was handcuffed. This, yes. can no longer, this can no longer go on. I have a question, uh, Sister Lucia Khadija. Why, why have we become so apologetic, many, many, many of our people, what, what, what caused this? So, well, I feel, uh, I'm sorry. Go, I yes, feel yes. that, I feel that, like I said, I feel that we've been taught, we've been taught to turn the other cheek. And don't get me wrong, I don't have an issue or problem with forgiveness. I don't have mm-hmm. a problem with giving a person a long rope. You know, I, I don't mm-hmm. have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem with is teaching people how to be doormats. You know, to to feel ashamed for being black, making us feel somehow that we're the burden bearers, and that it's our fault, and that we're the and that it's it's our fault, and that we're the perpetrators of this. We were placed in a condition that we are forced to try to get out of. You know, repair has to be um, given to to African people here and abroad. So to answer your question, I think that. The reason why we're like that is because we've been taught to forgive. We've been, taught, we've been taught to turn the other cheek. We've been taught to forget about all that. That's in the past. Mm. You know, we've been taught to feel guilty for expressing any type of blackness. We've been taught to feel guilty for being angry about being oppressed and about being brutalized and, and having our culture and our religion and everything taken away from us. We've been taught subconsciously and consciously to feel guilty for expressing that. So I think that that's why a lot of our people are, are you know, are apologetic. Even when we laugh, we, we, mm. we tend to, like, try to hide our laugh, you know, because we've been taught mm. not to openly even express our happiness in public. The laughing barrel, that, that expression, laughing barrel, there's a history to that. When black, when slaves had to, when slaves wanted to laugh, they had to put their head in the barrel to laugh. So when they came up in the presence of white folks, they were straight faced. And even to this day, you still see that amongst our people. You still see that when we're laughing and joking and having a good time, we tend to cover our mouths and kind of like mm. power back. Mm. Like we're doing, it, it, mm-hmm. and we, we need to analyze and observe that. So this wow. is why I think that, you know, that we're like that because we've been taught to be that way. And it's up to us to try to, to understand where that history comes from and then move forward from there to get out of that um, pit. For those, for those who say that, you know, we have a black president and, this shows that racism is going away and white supremacy, uh, you know, uh, doesn't exist. What do you have to say about that? Well, I mean, I believe to some extent that Obama was selected and not, mm-hmm. I mean, he was probably was elected, but to some point in time, at some point, I believe that he was selected. And um, mm-hmm. I would say mm-hmm. to the youth that if it shows to the youth that you can strive to be whatever you can be, if it proves mm-hmm. to the youth that, you know, you can um, move forward and, and try to be the best that you can be, I think that that's where that's good at. But, I mean, mm-hmm. we see how Obama, he's the most scrutinized president that I've ever seen. I mean, everything, yeah, even yeah. his wife, what kind of stocking she wears, what gym she goes to, the kids, mm-hmm. her, mm-hmm. him. The reason why mm-hmm. Obama is under so much scrutiny is for, like, a min- many reasons. Well, I'll name five of them. One, because mm-hmm. he's black. Two, mm-hmm. because he's black. Three, because mm-hmm. he's black. Four, mm-hmm. because he's black. And five, because he's black. So it doesn't mean that because we have a black president. In fact, because mm-hmm. we have a black president shows now more white supremacy and racism. In fact, we're going to see that more now than we ever have been because these people are coming out and actually mm-hmm. displaying their um, anger and displaying their um you know, this happiness with us having a black president. I mean, people like the, like the Tea Party, for example, they're coming off and telling, they're saying, we've got to take our country back. This is the type of stuff that white supremacists talk about. 
because they feel mm. just, they fear genetic annihilation. They fear that the world is being taken over by people of color, black and Hispanic. So now that we have a black president, I mean, white America is tripping. They don't know what to do except try to find fault with every little thing that he's doing. If he doesn't do this right, if he, does, if he tries to help the people, he's wrong. If he doesn't try to do this, he's wrong on that. So we must, look, we must take a very close look at that and see how Obama is under so much scrutiny. And it's not just because he's a young president. It's because he's black, plain mm-hmm. and simple. Mm-hmm. What is the meaning of black power, and why is black power needed in, uh, today? Black power is the ability to define, defend, and develop what is in the best interest of black people. But most importantly, black power is self-defining and self-defending. We must define who we are as black people. That's what black power is. We don't need people to tell us how to hurt, how to be black, how we should call ourselves, how we should express our cultural um, expression. We don't need people, we don't need other people, specifically white folks, to tell us how to be black and how to do things. If you want to help, you can contribute, but you cannot try to take over. And black power is something that we have to, we have, to have our own. We have to build mm-hmm. our own programs. You know, we have mm-hmm. to learn from the great, look, learn from our foremothers and forefathers. Go to the feet of your elders and sit and speak with them and ask them, how did you do it? You know, what was it that you did? And move from there. And we have to have unity. As cliche as that may sound and as corny as that may sound, we have to come together and we have to be unified. If we don't have, if we don't have unity, we're not going to have no kind of black power whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And what is the black power movement about? The black power movement is the civilian wing, if you will, of the new Black Panther Party. And it's a conglomerate of black organizations around the nation and around the world who come together to um, discuss what we can do to try to further our people and try to further our liberation. Um, And it's not just one organization that's doing it, but it's a conglomerate of black organizations around the world and around the country, especially especially nationwide. Um, You know, we come together to try to, you know, to try to do that, to try to see how, because we're in a state of emergency right now. Black America is in a state of emergency because we have so many things that are going on right now. We have hate crimes that are, that are like, really out of proportion. We have a black president that people are mad at. And um, so the Black Power Convention that's going to be held in Atlanta, Georgia, this Friday from the 28th to next Friday, from the 28th to the 31st, is very, very important. And the topic is going to be the, uh, the state of emergency. We're in a state of emergency. So I know I kind of like went off the tangent a little bit, but that's what black power is, Develop, developing, defining what is ours, and being self-defining and self-defending as black people. Mm-hmm. A question I have, Sister, is um, what, what are some things that the Black uh, Panther Party are involved in now? What are some cases um, that your, uh, the party is engaged in across the country? Well, right now what we're doing, we're doing um, food and clothing drives, um, which we've been doing now for about 14 months. Uh, mm-hmm. We call it the People's Survival Program. Actually, mm-hmm. we've done this. We do this um, on the shoulders of our foremothers and forefathers who did the breakfast program and who started a lot of other programs that, um, that the United States system has taken, has co-opted and, you know, did their own, like their free breakfast programs that they're doing in the public schools now. Um, that was started by the Black Panther Party. So we do this on the shoulders of our foremothers and forefathers, but it's called the People's Survival Program, um, which was um, named by our former chairman, um, Shaka Shakur. He was the one that initiated that, gave it that name. But we do food and clothing drives. Um, we have a um, rescue, you know, like a medical rescue team that we started um, in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, our founding chapter, um, has, has, has the Black Cross um, initiative. You know, where they've been working um, to send stuff, you know, like things that are needed by our people there in Haiti. Um, they've been sending stuff out. So we have, and they're, they're growing and moving in terms of giving um, courses and stuff on disaster preparedness. We need that because the time is coming that we need to prepare for disaster. That, that is going to happen. So and we need to prepare for that. So that's where um, the New Black Panther Party for Self-Defense comes in. And we teach our people. We teach our people. We give medical programs. 
Um, we have political education classes. Um, and there's a host of things that we do to try to help our people. What I find interesting, Sister Khadija, is that it's, it's funny that, you know, the white media, you know, um, doesn't, you know, show the great things that many of our progressive organizations organizations are doing and everything. They're ready to show what, what other folk are doing and uh, as if we're invisible. You know, can you speak on that? And what, what can we do to combat it? Uh, combat about uh, against that in terms of uh, utilizing certain uh, resources we have. Well, what we have to do is we have to get out in the street. That's like that's the mm-hmm. old, that's the old-fashioned way. It's not really old-fashioned, but we can't depend yeah. on others to put our story out. We have to get out in the street and um, and put our own story out. We have to we have to start doing street speaking, like people did mm-hmm. back in the '60s, like Malcolm X and a host of other greats. They got out there in the street and they spoke to the mm-hmm. people. The word, word of mouth has always been the best way to get information out. Having our own radio and our own television stations, um, we have to be able to have our own press, you know, the black press, our time press, Amsterdam News, and a host of other um, black media press, um, you know, electronic mm. and print media that's not afraid to tell it like it is. That's not, a, that's not afraid to tell our story and to tell what we're doing, because the white media, in truth and in fact, is not going to do it. And if they are going to do it, they're, they're not going to tell the whole story. They're either not going to tell the whole story or they're going to distort it in some way, shape, or form. So we have to depend on us. We have mm-hmm. to depend on us to tell our story. Nobody's going to tell our story like that. So we got to get out there in the street. We have to get out there in the street. we got to do street speaking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I see that you have a very... A uh, powerful newspaper um, that has been put out. Can you uh, let the listening audience uh, know about that newspaper? Oh yes, we have our New Black Panther newspaper, um, which has a host of very. Um, it's a hot paper. It has a hot, mm-hmm. it has a low, mm-hmm. it has a host of uh, different articles in there. It talks about the um, the right wing um, attack on the New Black Panther Party um, for um, voter intimidation, which the um, representatives in Texas and in Virginia tried to bring charges up against the New Black Panther Party for voter intimidation. It was brought mm-hmm. before Eric Holder um, and the Department of Justice. They, they found it to have no merit, and they, they dropped mm. the case, and they're still pushing that. So it's a, it's a whole article in the New Black Panther Party newspaper about that. Um, mm-hmm. It also mm-hmm. talks, it's, it's an article in there about um, what we're doing, you know, across the nation, the representatives and the chapters that we have in the Gambia, that we have in France, that we have in the U.K. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There is an article in there about my trip to Haiti, when I went to Haiti, what I experienced, what I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And this just it's a very, very hot newspaper, so we encourage people to get out there and get it. Um, if you need information on how to get the newspaper, I can give you a telephone number, um, mm-hmm. if I may. Um, the telephone, you can, the call, you can call Brother Hannibal. He's in charge of the newspapers here in New York, and his telephone number is 347 Six six one four one seven four. Again, Brother Hannibal, he's our national assistant in the New Black Panther Party. He's in charge of the newspapers, and his telephone number is three four seven six six one four one seven four. Or you can call myself, Sister Khadija, three four seven five nine seven three five one eight. Thank you, Sister Khadija. Also, um, you went on a trip to Haiti. And uh, I read the article in the Amsterdam newspaper, and I was so touched. I was so touched by the description of the things you saw, and I was actually in tears. I was in tears. It hit me so hard. And uh, um, just the the condition that people were in and how you mentioned in the article about raised the question about the medical supplies uh, that did not get to the people. Um, can you please give the audience an uh, idea of the things you saw, the condition of the people, and what was uh, the situation like uh, in terms of the medical supplies? Well, um, when we arrived in, first of all, we had to go through um, Santo Domingo to get the quarter print, which to me, you know, it was an issue because, I mean, I didn't see any reason why we couldn't land directly in port au you know, I guess there was a lot of stuff going on, but for whatever reason, we couldn't land directly in Port-au-Prince. 
we had to go through Santo Domingo, which was fine. But what I saw in one of the airports that were closed down on the tarmac was cases and loads of medication, food, food stuff, um, things for children that were wrapped up on the the loading docks, I guess you can call them. They were wrapped up, and they were being guarded by the U.S. Army. And on in that on that airport, on that tarmac, um, was a tent hospital, a 40-bed tent hospital, which was designed really to take care of a lot of the orthopedic um, amputees, a lot of amputees that took place. They had specialized, you know, people that dealt with that. So we went to the airport, you know, to check that out. And when we went there, we saw all the stuff there on the, the airport. Everything was all covered up, you know, stuff that was given from China, all wrapped up, and they had barbed wire um, a barrier so you couldn't get but so close to it. So I went up to one of the brothers that's in the Army with the gun sticking out, and I'm asking him, I said, why is all this stuff still here and it's not getting to our people? Our people, are still, I had just worked in the mm. hospital like the night mm. before at port mm-hmm. prince General Hospital where there was not a lot of stuff. There was things that the people needed, like IV solutions, certain types of IV solutions that people who had certain conditions needed, and we couldn't get to it because it's on the tarmac in the airport. So I asked the brother there from the U.S. Army, I'm like, why is this stuff still here? And they, he tells me that he's not authorized to release any of that stuff. I said, well, who is authorized to release it? I said, mm. because we need it for our people. And um, I think he did mention USAID. He mentioned USAID which I think needs to be, you know, we need to look into that and find out what part um, they play in terms of giving the green light, if you will, to distribute. You know, why is it still sitting there? If, if we know that there's people in the outskirts of Haiti that need that, or people right in Port of Prince that need it, why is it sitting there? We had asked him how long has it been sitting there. He, he had told us a couple of a weeks. So it had been sitting there for weeks. And, I mean, of course. Certainly, this is not just my account. We saw Anderson Cooper from CNN and Dr. Sanjay Gupta from there. He was he, he couldn't take it anymore. He had to take a reporter to the place and get wow. the, the stuff himself. So, I mean, it's not just my sentiment, but it's the sentiment of you know other people as well that, that wanted to help. Hmm. So, um, but it, despite all of that, I saw the resilience and the and the um, the determination of the Haitian people. One of the things I've learned and I've seen firsthand is that the Haitian people are a determining spirit. They have a determining um, spirit. They move forward despite everything that's going on. They still do what they have to do. You know, mm-hmm. and that was one of the things that I saw oftentimes. Um, you know, I worked the night shift, me and another sister from the um, December 12th movement and the Bedside Volunteer Ambulance Corps. Um, we went, we worked seven nights a week, 13-hour shifts. And um, when we came out in the morning, we were so exhausted emotionally and physically um, because there was no such thing as taking a break. We just worked straight for 13 hours. However, wow. our people needed us, we were there. And when we came out in the morning and we waited for transportation, right across from the hospital, I saw people standing, I saw people out there with their carts. They were selling stuff and cooking mm. and just continuing to move on and right, and right in front of all that rubble. You know, they stood in front of rubble, quick down buildings, and they were there still moving forward. And I felt kind of bad and guilty for coming out working a 13-hour shift, feeling tired and feeling down over what I saw. And these people have to live this on a day-to-day basis. See, I get to go back. I get to come back home. But, I mean, mm-hmm. these people have to stay there and deal with it. And I found myself looking to them for strength. Every morning when I came out, I was just standing there and just looked to them because they gave me the strength and the power that I needed to get ready to go back to go do the other shift, you know, and to, mm-hmm. to realize how strong and powerful the Haitian people are. It's, it's it, it's, it's really mind-blowing. It's really, really mind-blowing. But we saw a lot. We worked with medics from the 82nd Airborne who were very, very helpful. Um, they, um, The hospital that I worked in, uh, I called this, you know, as I mentioned in the Amsterdam News, I called this the death, the death ward. I call it the hell hole. Some of the medics that mm-hmm. we worked with called it the death chamber mm-hmm. because, you know, people were dying like every night or every other night due to lack of the things that they needed, like certain antibiotics and certain IV solutions that they needed they didn't have that, and a lot of our people over there were dying. Uh, we saw um, situations where the cots and the beds where the patients laid on had no sheets. They were dirty. They were dusty. Um, there were rats. There were roaches. There were mice. There was times that the electricity went off. We worked with mm. um, headlights, mm. So, and we also had little um, small flashlights that we carried in our packs. 
So in case the lights went off like for a half hour or so, we had lights that we could, um, you know, work with. So those are the things that we had, you know, to deal with. Um, there were, I want to add that there were things at the hospital, um, some of the things that we, you know, there were things that people sent, you know, like mm -hmm. local mm -hmm. hospitals like St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital and Joint mm -hmm. Disease. They had sent things to Port-au-Prince. But the things that I looked at was the stuff that was on the tarmac, that stayed on the tarmac. We could have, we needed that, and we did not have access to that. And I think that that contributed a lot to the demise of our people there in Haiti, mm -hmm. along with another power structure system. I mean, that, 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 that's another history class. But, um, you know, I think that contributed a lot to it, you know, to the demise of our people. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want you to know, uh, Sister uh, Khadija, is that uh, Unison Global Talk, you know, we're going to always be open, you know, in terms of you being able to share some, you know, valuable information in regards to the, you know, Haiti situation because, you know, as you can see that the, the media, you know, has, you know, media again has thrown it out, the, uh, thrown it by the wayside and everything, and it goes back to what you're saying. You said earlier about us using our, uh, the power we have and the resources we have to get, uh, information pertaining to our people out. Um, right. In the last, in the last few uh, minutes, I, I would like to um, uh, know about the uh, Black Power Conference that is coming up, the Black Power Conference, and what will be taking place at the conference? Well, the Black Power Conference um, will be taking place next Friday, the 28th to the 31st, um, mm -hmm. and the topic of our Black Power Conference is we're in a state of emergency. And we're going to have a host of people that will be there. Dr. Farah Gray will be there. Uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan will also be there. He's expected to be there. Um, and it will be taking place at, um, at the Crown Plaza Hotel and uh, Morris Brown College. It will be taking place there. And it'll be, we'll, be, we'll be doing, like, different programs and different workshops, like, um, you know, throughout the day, from Friday to, sun, uh, Friday to Sunday. Friday to Monday, actually. And it's geared to try to, um, you know, to uplift and educate our people because we have to first educate our people to empower them. They, without, their, without no knowledge and wisdom or application of that knowledge, we're, we're not empowered. So first, one of the things that we want to do with the various workshops that we're going to be having is we want to educate our people to empower them to move, move them forward. The very last day, which is the 31st, from 12 noon to 7 o'clock, we will have a youth day, which I'm sure that Brother Hannibal will be in charge of that or be participating in that. And basically we'll be talking about a youth movement, you know, how we can move our youth forward because that is very well needed in this, in this country that we're in now, especially in the state of emergency that we're in. You know, we, like I said, we have a black president and white America is pissed off, you know, and they're going to cloak it and guys that under things that could be done better or not being done, but we all know what time it is. So we're, we're definitely in a state of emergency, so this is what the conference is geared to do to empower and to, um, to educate first and to empower our people. Can we please have a number, a uh, telephone number, where uh, if anybody needs to reach you? Okay, yes, 347-597-3548. Um, that's three four seven five nine seven three five one eight. Great. I want to say uh, thank Excuse you. Excuse the background um, noise. I'm in the train right now, so it's kind of noisy. Well, don't worry about it. Don't worry. You're taking care of business, and that's a good thing. Um, I want to say uh, thank you, Mr. Khadija, for your integrity and for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on uh, Unison Global Talk. And I, um, I ask that you come back back on the show again soon. Um, oh, definitely. I definitely will. Thank you so much, sister, and have a blessed day. You too. Thank you so much for having me. All right, peace. You're welcome. Bye-bye. I uh, asked the listening audience um, to support um, the new Black Panther Party. Um, they're doing outstanding work across this country, and uh, they're making a positive difference in our community. And we ask that you please get in contact with Sister Khadija Shakur and Brother Hannibal Rushadine, Minister, uh, Brother Minister Hannibal uh, Rushadine. Uh, that's his son. 
and everything, and he's one of the leading young figures in this country and everything, and I encourage our listening audience to support them because they're doing a lot of work to uplift our community, and they're making significant sacrifices on our behalf. So we have a moral obligation to do whatever we can. Even if we can't make it, everybody can do something. Uh, it is about uh, everybody has something to give. Never think that uh, because you are in a certain position that you don't have much to offer. You were made to see the day and take, not take anything for granted. And I ask uh, you to please tune in. Please let your friends know uh, about Unison Global Talk. Uh, please tune in next Friday to this show. Uh, where we we will be discussing uh, more issues. We will be touching on Lebanon, the issue of what's going on in Lebanon. And I want to say to you, stay strong, keep your head up, and let's stay in unison. Have a good day, and God bless you. (laughs) 